This week, uh, we're going to do command and configuration generation. Uh, on some of your homeworks last week, I saw that some people were using commands and automating the usage of commands. Um, and that was the whole point. So when we started with regular L uh, agents, we're like, have the LLM do everything. And of course, uh, it's only trained on specific tasks, natural language tasks. So it does things like what, like reverse engineering a binary. It can't do that. And so we're like, okay, let's build a custom, you know, tool for that. And let's programmatically do that. Um, but then if you look around, uh, you could program your custom tool in Python, but there's a whole bunch of other tools that people have written that are purpose built for the thing that you want to do. And so if you find these really good purpose built tools to accomplish a particular task, then what you would do is you would write your LLM agent and then you would call into those tools and your agent is kind of an orchestrator of tools. Uh, and so, you know, that's just to put these things, you know, in your toolbox, so to speak, you can, you can start accessing sort of higher level functionality that is outside of the LLM. Um, and so that's what we're going to do now. So uh, we're going to talk specifically about commands and, and configuration generation in this particular, in this class. Um, okay, so let's get started. So uh, if you were in computing before LLMs, which all of you were, uh, and you thought about, hey, I'm going to go to my computer and I'm going to navigate, I'm going to uh, do something on my computer to get something done. Uh, you first create a plan for what you want done. And then if you don't know the command syntax or the language syntax, the configuration syntax, you would Google it. Or maybe you would go to the man pages or, or, or this sort of thing. Figure out how to express what you want to do into the syntax of the commands or the configuration language. And then you would craft those commands or craft that configuration file that you want to create. And then you would execute it, and almost inevitably, it wouldn't work the first time. And so you would end up iterating, and you would go to Stack Overflow and this sort of thing. Uh, so with LLMs, this is your nirvana. You're going to be like, I don't have to go and look at syntax at all. You know, I'll put an asterisk there. Uh, because then what you would do is you would say, hey, I want to do this thing. And all you would have to do is precisely express it in natural language giving all the details of what you want done in that, in that uh, expression. And then you're like, okay, LLM, produce the syntax that, that does this and then potentially execute it. It depends on how much you trust the LLM uh, on, the, on the generation. Uh, and so that's what we're gonna try and do in this class. We're gonna try and see if we can trust the LLM to actually execute commands. Okay, so the, there are two parts to this lab for this week. The first part is command generation, and then the second part is configuration generation. So uh, with the program I'm gonna have you run is, is very simple. It takes your React agent uh, that you have used earlier, and then it allows you to send the program a, some specific instructions that are gonna be used by the React agent. So this is basically a pattern we've seen before, where we have the base React prompt and we say, hey, your mission agent is to do this. And so in this case, I'm like, oh, answer the user's request by running ls, uh, so the listing command via terminal. And then when the user gives a prompt like this, say list all files in the current directory, then it knows I'm gonna just execute ls as is. Okay, so that's basically the pattern. We're gonna supply this program the actual instructions and then in an interactive loop, we will get the agent to execute whatever the user types in to the prompt. So that's what we'll do. So the first set of, uh, the first exercise is to navigate the process tree in Linux. And so the commands for listing processes, which is PS, listing open files per process, ls of, uh, listing the kernel data structures of every single process that is on the operating, running in the operating system. Well, that's in the slash proc file system. Uh, listing all of the scheduled processes, things are, that are about to run. And so in the malware uh, reverse engineering course, we have all of these ways of doing process forensics. And rather than having you learn all of the individual commands, you just say what you want and then see if the LLM can do it. Now, sometimes it will be able to do this. 
And then sometimes you have to run it multiple times to get the answer that you want. Uh, but we're getting there. I would su suspect within a year or two, it's going to be really good at doing all of this stuff. So one of the examples that I have you uh, do in the lab is, hey, using sudo, find all the names of the processes that have open network connections. So if an adversary has got a backdoor, a listening socket on a, or a backdoor listening socket on your machine, you can just reveal that in an ls of. And so you don't need to learn ls of or the dash i flag of ls of. You just say, I'm just going to give you this text and then you're going to do the lsf command. I don't have to worry about it. Uh, show the path of the executable file used to launch SSHD. So if you suspect SSHD has been trojaned, you'd be like, well, what's the binary that's actually being used to run that thing? And of course, you would basically, you could do a PS listing to find the SSHD process. And then based on the PID of the SSHD process, you would go into slash proc and look at the executable. And that would give you that path. So again, you don't have to learn slash proc. You just say, uh, just give me it. And then hopefully it will execute this. Um, you'll see that the, uh, there's many ways of doing this. Uh, in fact, I learned a new way of doing this just by doing this lab. There's this thing called process grep, pgrep. I had no idea this was a thing. And it's like, uh, so, so like chat, this is where ChatGPT knows more than me. Because it's given me all these pgrep commands. I'm like, what the heck is pgrep? It's process grep. Uh, and so like, yeah, I don't need to unlearn the old way. I just express it this way and then, and then ChatGPT can run it. Okay, here's another one. So this is something that malware uh, really loves to do. It's like, hey, run the binary and then delete it because I don't want to get caught by file integrity sort of checks. Like if I have a, a sort of a scanner scanning the file system for malware, I want to make sure I can launch the process, delete the binary so I'm not in the file system anymore. So one of, the, uh, one of the forensic commands you would want to do is just look for any, any process that has deleted in terms uh, with, the, with the executable. And then you're, you're, um, you, you can find those, those uh, hollowed out processes or the processes that, are, that have the binaries deleted. Uh, you can find the current working directory of the Python process using the CWD. Uh, you can find the PID of the Python process and then use slash proc to show its environment. Uh, and then you can show all processes that have a current working directory of slash temp. So sometimes malware uh, will, will can guarantee, malware when it's on your machine can guarantee it has access to slash temp because everyone has access to slash temp. So an unprivileged process that is run will always be able to read and write slash temp. And so that's where you can, you know, those processes that are running out of slash temp are suspicious. Okay, so those are the examples that I'm having you do. Uh, oh, the last one, show all of the scheduled tasks on the machine. So there's many ways of getting Linux to wake up and run a, run a command. And this is the way you can hide on a machine is to hide in the scheduled tasks. So cron is uh, the service for doing timed execution of commands. So you look at cron tabs, every user's cron tab. Uh, so each user can set up a scheduled task. And then in Etsy cron.d, there's all sorts of uh, scripts that will run daily, hourly, and these sorts of things that you can find. OK, so that's all the process stuff. Uh, the next part of the lab is file searching and regular expression uh, construction. And so the commands that uh, we're going to have you do is egrep, which is uh, basically a text and regular expression file search. If you're looking for specific lines in your, in your file, uh, you would use egrep. And then in this particular lab, I have you do word counting to, to, to find out the number, of, the number of lines that match a particular expression. And I have you search this rocku.txt file. This is a data dump of all of the passwords that have been found in this very famous Yahoo no, it's not a Yahoo thing. Uh, th this very famous, uh, this particular service, this Rocky service, stored all of the usernames and passwords in clear text. And so a lot of people use this as like uh, a corpus for credential stuffing attacks where they're just reusing these passwords. And so you can say, rather than learning the regular expression language, because it's quite complex. If you have ever seen a, a, a really uh, sort, of, sort of complex regular expression, it's hard to parse. It's hard to read, 
and it's hard to generate these things. It's much easier to say what you want and then have the right have the engine uh, construct what you want. And this is where LLMs are perfect for, right? Like you can actually do this translation very easily. So uh, the first example is how many passwords begin with the letter A? And of course, you would use the hat to match the beginning of the of the line. Um, so this is one password per line in this data dump. So you would say match the beginning and the first character after the beginning of the line is A. Um, passwords that begin with the number one, this is the same thing, but with the number one instead of A. How many passwords consist of only alphabetic characters? And so you can say from the beginning of the password, I only want lowercase letters or uppercase letters. And then the plus character says as many of those in a row, zero or more of those in a row, or no, at least one or more, sorry. Plus means one or more. And then this is followed by the end of line character on this regular expression, which is the dollar. Um, how many passwords are made up of exactly six numbers? And then you could say, okay, hat zero to nine, and then this matches exactly six numbers for this word. And then list all passwords that begin with A, B, C, D, E, and end with the number nine, and similar. You got the hat, A, B, C, D, E, and then dot star means any character. The dot is any character. Star means match zero or more, and then followed by the ending, which has to be nine and the end of the line. So I'm just going to have you do this uh, through an LLM, and then you can actually check the results. So when you run this, make sure that you look at what the LLM actually generated, because sometimes the LLM doesn't, doesn't generate the right thing, actually. In fact, often, often it doesn't. Well, actually, it depends on the LLM you're using. So maybe G GPT-40, I just, oh, they just enabled it. And then I was running some of these queries this morning and almost immediately I ran out of quota. So I, I wasn't able to test some of these things because I was doing other, other random queries on it. But like you should be able to do at least, I would say maybe 20 or 30 queries through 4.0. Um, so that's what I would recommend. If, you're, if, if, you, if you can save up your queries on uh, GPT, chat GPT 4.0 just for the, for the labs, that would be good. Okay, uh, so another command that uh, has a whole bunch of flags that you don't want to memorize, but you, you want to actually use the functionality of the command is find. So find uh, is a find the files in the file system. So here's an example, find all set UID or set group ID programs in slash bin. And of course it knows that the flag to do this is to look at the permission bits. And so there's implicit, so this is the, uh, sort of user, group, and other permission bits, 0, 0, 0. And then that, that most significant byte is basically the set UID bits. Uh, so that's where it's doing the 4,000 and the 2,000. Um, so this is set UID. This is set group ID on that. OK, here's another one. Find all elf executables in slash bin. bin. And so the, the flag to send find is the dash uh, to execute the file command. So file tells you uh, the type of file uh, that's in the, um, that that file represents. And then you can basically grep out elf executables using this flag. Uh, and you can actually run these. So after, so, so the agent's actually gonna generate these and run them. And then you can actually have it point to directories where you know there are particular elf binaries in just to double check the work uh, that this agent is doing. Uh, all, find all files modified in the last day. So that's the modify time flag. Um, so dash M time one. Uh, all files created in the last day. And that's the create time uh, of one. Uh, find all SSH authorized key files in slash home. And so you look for all file types that are fi regular files. Uh, and then the name being authorized keys. And then find all history files and user directories that have size zero. And so here you're doing the type uh, flag to say regular files. You're saying the size has to be zero and the name has to match uh, a regular expression of a dot followed by any number of characters. And then the history is at the end. OK, uh, the next set of uh, exercises are deal with network commands. And in particular, I chose IP tables because a lot of the network commands are easy. Uh, but IP tables is hard. 
like there's so many flags to IP tables because you're basically specifying all the firewall rules of a host using IP tables. And this is the more often than not, this is what I'm stack overflowing and Google searching when I'm doing configuration on my Linux machine. Uh, and so some examples, uh, what command allows SSH traffic from uh, this subnet, 131.252.220.0 slash 24. And so it will say, hey, add, add a rule on the input chain. So IP tables has an input chain and an output chain based on whether or not the packets are being received, which is input, and being sent, which is the output chain. So on the input chain, for TCP packets destined for the SSH port, which is 22, and have the source of this prefix, this CIDR prefix, accept, accept that uh, packet. So that's, that's, that's a way of, of getting just this plain text, this natural language question into an actual prompt or an actual command. And then here's another one. What command allows incoming connections to ports 80 and 443, which are the two web ports uh, from, in this case, the Portland State uh, addresses, 131.252.0.0, and it's similar, except it's using a multi-port flag, because rather, I mean, it could have done this with two separate uh, commands, but in this case, it says it's going to use multi-port and say, I'm going to allow both 80 and 443 from the source of this prefix, and then accept that. <laughs> Uh, and then the, the next one is this input, uh, uh, this command. So say you have a web server and the web server has a database backend and you're like, hey, if there's a web vulnerability on the web server, I don't want an adversary to be able to do a connection to all of the other parts of my backend infrastructure. I have a private network over there. And I don't want the web server ever to be able to SSH into other parts of my infrastructure. And so one of the things you could do on that web server is build a IP tables rule that only allows outgoing connections to a database server, a database backend. And so this is how you would, you, this is what you would express potentially. Uh, and so you would say, okay, well, uh, I want on the outgoing chain to allow TCP connections to this database server which is at 10.0.0.10. So the destination is the database service, database service, and then the port, the MySQL database listens on 3306. So the outgoing port, uh, I want you to accept this outgoing connection. Uh, now, in order for me to do a bidirectional connection to the database, I also have to add something on the input chain for the response that comes back from the database server. And so this is where you should get, the LLM should be able to actually add this input chain rule uh, that says if the source uh, IP address is the database server and that source port is 3306, so this is the reverse uh, part of this, then uh, if, this is in, if this packet is associated with a connection that is already established, accept that. And then this locks down that that web server to only be able to access the database server on an outgoing connection. So you can see how this is kind of useful, right? Uh, like I, you don't have to necessarily, well, if you can get the LLM to do this reliably, then you don't necessarily have to learn these individual syntax commands of, of IP tables. And then here's one, uh, those are all accepts. What about deny? So I'm gonna deny all traffic from 1.1.1.1. And so on the input chain, uh, if the source is 1.1.1, I'm just going to drop the thing. Um, so all the other ones were except. OK, uh, the next set of commands is audit logging. <clears throat> and I hope to do at like week nine some more on logging and threat intelligence. But if you're on your machine and you're trying to get forensic information about what has happened onto it, then there's all sorts of log files on a Linux machine. And you want to be able to access the information on that Linux machine. And so who, this is just simple ones, like who says list the logged in users. And then last, last B and last log, this is all information on who last logged in, like the, the users that logged in. And, and last B is failed logins. Uh, can you get me information about who has tried to log into this machine and, and failed? 
and so find all the currently logged in users. You just use who. Find the last five successful logins, last.n5. Uh, find the last five unsuccessful logins, last b.n5. Uh, and then find the last five logins from the root user. And then you would just say, well, like I can, I can, like if I don't have to learn these things, so I learned these things because when I was a system administrator, like yeah, yeah, you have to learn this. <laughs> you have to memorize these flags. You have to memorize the commands and the flags. But now I don't have to. I can just give it what I want, and then it will do this. So that's what the agent is supposed to do. The agent that I've given you is supposed to allow you to do this. Now you have to double check though. Always double check that it's actually doing the the thing that you want it to, especially with Gemini. I don't want to pick on Gemini, but I've had, yeah, Gemini can do, can generate some wonky things. Okay, so those are simple Linux commands. Uh, this is a security class, and there are a boatload of really cool security commands that you would like to automate the use of. One in particular is Nmap. If you go to the man pages of Nmap, it is enormous. There are uh, hundreds of different options. And you're like, I can't memorize all these options. I don't know what a stealth scan is. I don't know what a Christmas scan is, uh, these sorts of things. I don't know the syntax of all of these things, but I want to be able to run these things uh, that are there. And so Nmap, uh, so it stands for, it's an open source network scanner. And you basically point this at a network to discover targets. And when you've discovered those targets, you can use Nmap to then determine the operating system that's being run, the services that are running on that machine, and their versions. This is super useful, right? If you're trying to do an inventory of your network, or if you're trying to, like an adversary would use this to attack a network, to figure out what the attack surface is of the target that they're attacking, you would run Nmap for sure. And so, for example, it's like, hey, find me all the machines that are up at Portland State. And then I would just do an Nmap on the Portland State prefix, and then Nmap would go and scan all of the machines uh, in this uh, in this university. Okay, so this thing is so popular; it's appeared in all these movies. <laughs> so, like you can see, and then, and actually, it's really well done. The, when they show up in these movies, like the the they the screenwriters actually have done a good job uh, representing what the tool does. Um, so what I'm going to have you do is use natural language to see if you can get the LLM agent to actually execute the proper Nmap scans. So when you say, hey, find all of the services running on the web for Pentester 1 VM. And so uh, as part of this lab, you're going to be setting up these two vulnerable virtual machines on Google Cloud. And then what you're going to do is you're going to run your agent on the course VM and you're going to say, hey, find the services that are running on each of these two virtual machines. Now, when you create these virtual machines, make sure when you do the scan that you're scanning on the internal IP address of those machines. Because if you make a mistake and you scan the external IP address, Google Cloud is going to flag your account, your project, and disable it. So it's really important that you, like whenever you do a scan, do the 10 dot X dot Y dot Z. So the thing that starts with the 10, which is a private, your pi private network interface. Uh, and I just want to get that out of the way because inevitably one or two people every quarter get their project uh, uh, basically banned off of Google. Not banned, but like disabled. Um, so you're going to find all of the services that are running on these, these two virtual machines. You, you're, you are going to do the versioning. Um, so the dash capital O flag of Nmap will actually try and do a fingerprint on the operating system that's running on that virtual machine to give you the version of the operating system. And then it can actually do a deep scan on the web server itself to figure out the version of the server that it runs. And this is all really useful information for an adversary, at least, that's trying to compromise a particular machine. Uh, another really useful thing in Nmap are these NSC scripts. So Nmap scripting engine is what it's, what, what it's called. It's basically a library of programmatically handling the connection of the Nmap scan. So if you want to do a really deep scan on a particular website, you, you have this library of scripts that you can invoke 
to actually do interactive sort of uh, interactions with the, the site itself. And so these are the different classes of scripts that you can run against a particular machine. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to have you run two specific ones. Uh, because these are web servers and web applications, we're going to have you do these two NSC uh, scripts. HTTP enum enumerates all the directories on these virtual machines using a dictionary attack. So one of these things that, that server administrators might do is do security by obscurity. I will have these directories in the web server that I'm not expecting people to visit. I just won't put direct links to them, and then they'll be fine. But they're not anticipating someone with a huge dictionary from just trying every single word in this dictionary to see if your hidden directory is in the word list. Did you want to? I've been there. <laughs> That's hard. All right. Um, so hgenum is just going to find these hidden directories. And you're just going to point it to, uh, again, the internal IP address. So you're going to run this all on Google Cloud so that you're doing the attack on your internal network. And then Google is happy <laughs> because it's all over the internal network. Uh, the next one is an HTTP brute force attack on the login credentials of a particular web page. Uh, so this is something where, hey, I have a website that's protected by a username password. Can I give, uh, can I give it a, a set of usernames and passwords and see if it can discover the login? Um, and that's what this, this module will do. OK. Uh, the next uh, command that I'm going to have you use is SQL map. So this SQL map tool basically probes websites for any SQL injection vulnerabilities that might be there. So they'll, you know, all of these, uh, that, that XKCD cartoon that's got, uh, or the OR1 is equal to one thing that I mentioned earlier, or the XKCD cartoon, those strings are just fuzzed into the website in order to detect whether or not there's a vulnerability. Like if it breaks syntax on a SQL statement, SQL map is going to find it. And you will see the, the, the actual string that is being used to try and break syntax will show up whenever you run SQL map on a particular website. And then you'll see exactly what was vulnerable uh, to this compromise. And so the idea is, hey, rather than me memorizing the SQL map syntax, I'm going to have the LLM run SQL map and then see if it can generate the actual command to compromise uh, these websites. And so here's an example. These are two examples that we're going to have you run. Um, and so, well, one of the things with SQL uh, map is that not only will it detect it, it will actually exploit it and exploit it in a way that will dump the entire contents of the database back out. Uh, so that's the ultimate, right? Like it's, it's one thing to actually uh, compromise or basically exploit, exploit the SQL injection, but it's another thing to actually take that exploitation and dump all the contents of the database, which is everything. And you can do this with one command. And so if you see this here with this SQL injection attack, you just say, hey, just dump the entire database. So here's the URL that might be vulnerable. And you'll see that this URL parameter is actually injectable. And then SQL map will find this and then use this injectability to actually dump the entire database for you. Uh, and then another uh, thing that you can do, uh, blind SQL injection, rather than um, putting the output of the SQL query um, back into the web page, uh, blind SQL injection only gives you one bit of information every time you interact with the site, whether or not the query succeeded or failed. Now, you would think with just that one bit of information on every query, you wouldn't be able to dump the entire database, but you would be incorrect. <laughs> And so if you took the web security class, you can see that basically one bit at a time can eventually give you the entire database backend. And this is what SQL map will do. And so for the 
um, I recommend you all do this, but what you could do is when you run this particular command, uh, and this is for the Natus uh, over the wire CTF uh, that, that um, we've been using in prior uh, weeks, it says, hey, uh, SQL map, I want you to compromise this website. Um, well, this is how you log in. So you have to give the Natus 15 uh, credentials and then say, hey, this username field, uh, this is your injection point. Whether or not this username exists or not is the only bit that you will get back from accessing this level. But then what I want you to do is to use this and then do a blind SQL injection attack that will dump the entire contents of this database. Now, this is going to take a while, right? Because it's getting one bit of information at a time. But if you let this run for about 10 or 15 minutes, you'll get the actual backend database for Natus 15. Um, and so this is something you can automate, uh, hopefully, uh, via the LLM. OK, the next uh, command that you're automating is this COMICS, uh, Command Injection Exploiter. And so uh, with, this, uh, with this tool, basically what the tool is going to do is going to fuzz your website for any parameter that might be vulnerable to command injection. So if you insert a semicolon, uh, for example, it might end that shell command and allow you to inject another shell command. So this is a tool that will automatically try that across all of the parameters on a particular website. And then when you give it this, so here I'm going to point comics to this, this URL. And then maybe this is injectable. Like if I put a semicolon here, uh, maybe it'll actually allow me to run a different command. Uh, and so if you send comics to this uh, URL, then it's going to try to get an injection. And you can see here, it basically uh, sends a semicolon followed by this echo command. And it actually sees that, yes, it's vulnerable to classic injection. And then it executes a shell for you on this. And then you basically have your, your shell uh, command where you can interact with this. OK, so for us to use this with the LLM, um, we, need you to, we need the agent to be able to interact with the tool host compromise. So it's, this is not like the other commands where you're, you're launching this command and it's producing a result and returning it. What, what, what happens with this command is that you launch it, it finds a vulnerability, and it drops you into this shell down here. Uh, so uh, Dave, David has written this script. Uh, and this is the second program in your lab, where it's basically within the tool, it's going to open a shell with the comics command and then spawn a thread that allows you to interact with the comics process from the agent. And that's what this code is doing. If you actually peek into the agent and look to what it's doing, it's, it's creating a thread to, to handle the interaction between the comics process and the agent uh, back and forth. So that's, that's what's going on. And then you're going to point this to the web for pen tester uh, URL. So if you look at this, it, you specify an IP address to ping. And then it just drops that IP address directly into the ping command. And so what you're going to do is you're going to point this tool to this URL and then get a shell and then start uh, executing uh, with this. OK, uh, the next set of commands are the Google dork commands. So many of you are using Google at a high level. Uh, and as you start to learn how to use Google, there's a, basically an expression language to communicate with Google the results that you want and the results that you don't want. Uh, so for example, like if you want the words, we the people all together, then you put the double quotes. If you only want files that are PDFs or files that are, have the extension of TXT, then you would give it these two directives. If you're only interested in uh, results from particular website domains, such as pdx.edu, you would use the site directive. Or if you're looking for content on specific social media platforms, then you would just say at Twitter for all, this, all the results that are from the Twitter platform. Um, in security, you're often restricting searches to things that are in the URL, in the title of the page, or within the text of the page. Uh, so with these things, like if the URL has admin, well, maybe it's the admin panel. Or if the title of the page has security in it, maybe it's a particular security products uh, page. And then that allows you to then visit those, those targets. It lets you narrow down the targets that you're interested in and then visit them. 
Um, you have the negation operator. So if you're interested in results that are not PDFs, then you just put the dash in front of it. And this, you could do the dash on any of these directives. And then you can add logical operators like, hey, any result that's either psychology or computer science along with design, um, you can add to this. And so then for this particular lab, can you have an LLM produce these, these appropriate things just based on natural language? Uh, and that's basically, so when you think about all of these AI chatbots that are integrating search, that's what they're doing, right? Because the way we interact with search now is gonna hopefully change. Uh, maybe not, I mean, maybe it's all, all of our, all the CS people who like, I don't wanna actually write English. I prefer writing code. <laughs> Maybe all of us will still be using Google as, as originally intended, but everyone else is actually gonna, gonna write full on text. Um, okay, the last set of command generation ones, I thought this was funny because it was kind of recursive. At the beginning of this lab, I have you run these commands to launch these virtual machines. And I thought that, hey, why don't we see if the LLM could have done that instead? And so these are the exact three commands that you run to create the web for pen tester VM. Um, and so since you know what the ground truth is, can you get the LLM if you specify a prompt correctly to actually run this, to produce it and run this? And you'll know that we don't have an agent that automatically deploys Google Cloud infrastructure because it doesn't work very reliably. Um, and this is gonna hopefully allow you to see whether or not you can get that thing to, to, to work. Okay, so the last several exercises are about configuration. Um, so one of the things that uh, happens is on every server, there's a bunch of um, services that are running. And then each service has a configuration file that you use to change the behavior of that server. So one of the most common configurations that you'll find on a Linux server is the web server configuration. And so in this case, you could either use Apache or Nginx you'd be like, hey, uh, I wanna not only uh, produce this server block, well, what I, first I wanna do, in case you don't understand what the Nginx configuration language is, the first thing I want you to do is have the LLM explain this block line by line. And then uh, after figuring out what all these directives actually do, then I'm gonna have you use the LLM to produce that configuration and see how accurate you can get the production part of it. So both summarizing and explaining followed by production of this configuration is this particular exercise. And we'll see how, how well this works. Um, uh, here's another one. This is the Terraform specification. I have people deploy in the cloud class. And so again, if you ha haven't taken the cloud class and you have no idea what Terraform is, Use the LLM to explain line by line what each one of these lines are doing, and then see if you can get it actually on the other side to produce this particular file using natural language. And we'll see how far we can get with that. Uh, likewise, another configuration is Kubernetes. So similar infrastructure as code. If you've never seen Kubernetes before, this is the exact file that is used in the cloud class to deploy the guestbook web app on a Kubernetes cluster. And so you can get the LLM to explain line by line what each one of these things does, and then see if you can actually get this thing produced on the other side. Okay, so that's all of the exercises I'm gonna have you do. Uh, I am going to bring up the labs. I'm gonna take a five minute break to bring up the labs and then uh, uh, go through them before I let you, let you go 